All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Lawrence Lepard. He's a career investment manager who focuses on sound money and manages his funds related to gold, silver and Bitcoin. He's known for sharing his views on the state of the global financial system, inflation, and the need for sound investments to protect against currency debasement. His ideas and explanations around these topics have helped me immensely in my learning journey about finance, so I'm super excited to talk oh, to you today. Oh, you're being kind, yeah. No, man, it's true. Like, yeah. I, I, first off, like, I would love to start with expressing my gratitude. Like, oh, it was you're very kind. Yeah, so no, I just, I'm just out on Twitter making a lot of noise, you know what I mean? I, <laughs> Yeah, I'm very but, angry what the central banks have done to the world. You know, they've hurt a lot of people. and uh, That's I, true. I feel, but, like, I feel like it's somebody's job to step up and scream about <laughs> it. That's me. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a great job. I mean, Thank like, I, I know how important it is to share this because I, I think it's nice to know that you don't know how far your voice yeah. travels. And as I mentioned, like you really influenced my learning. So, so I'm really well, grateful for that. That's, um, yeah. It's nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, awesome also to see you in real life last yeah, week right? in Madeira. The, we were both just at Bitcoin Atlantis and that was a fabulous gathering and, and really, you know, just the spirit of Bitcoin was there in a big way. It was great. Highly recommend yeah. that you go to shows like that. If you're a Bitcoiner. Fully agree. What was your biggest takeaway there? Uh, you know, I, I, I get more and more confident. I mean, I, I think that, you know, my journey has just been from, you know, I bought some coins in 2013 and you have to remember, I've been in gold before that. And, um, um, you know, they, there's a the whole etymology background history of Bitcoin is people had tried this before Bitcoin. I mean, there was, you know, e-gold and there were, there were online and tech, there, there were people who tried to create digitally based money before Bitcoin. They all failed. You know, now, now pieces of them got brought into the Bitcoin uh, code, but but for various reasons, none of them worked. And uh, so in 2013, when I first got involved, I bought some, but I, I frankly, I was skeptical. I thought, well, this will probably fail like all the other ones have. Uh, and of course, I was wrong about that. Mm. Um, but, you know, and as time goes by, you just get you develop more and more confidence and more and more certainty that, no, you know, it's not going to fail. And the technology is sound and what we see is correct. And. I think I came away from it after hearing sailors speak and talking to a lot of people. I mean, I, I really I'm beginning to feel like it's just it's absolutely inevitable that this monetary technology will subsume and replace all the other monetary technologies. And that, you know, I don't know what time frame. I'm not going to say that with certainty, but, you know, 20 years out, you know, maybe we won't be talking dollars. Maybe we'll be talking sats. Yeah, and it'll be like you know that that lunch cost me three sats or whatever the heck it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the relative values will be, but um, you know because um, a sat is is uh, an algorithmically determined thing that can't be overprinted, and so in terms of money, you know, one of, as you know, one of the key you know, important roles of money is that it maintain its value. You know, that be a store of value that you can earn it, hold it. And know that when you decide, you know, and that's holding it is it's called saving and know that when you decide, OK, you know, I've, I've worked for this money. I've got some savings. You know, I'd like to now cash it in and buy something that I would enjoy a vacation or a car or house or food, or whatever, um, to feel like you haven't been robbed. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I mean, what I would suggest and what I think you, you agree and I agree and you know, probably most of your listeners understand is that. Inflation really is kind of a silent form of theft. You know, you, you work hard, you make money, you're paid your money. And, you know, if you don't, if you spend it right away, well, then you, you don't suffer inflation per se. I mean, you might have suffered previous inflation, but, um, but if, you, if you decide to hold it for some period of time, you know, it's, it's highly certain that you will, your, your purchase, your actual purchasing power will decrease uh, if you're holding fiat currency. Um, so is, is this yeah. the biggest thing you think that, people don't understand about the financial system or that's a good question i mean i think some people understand it but i think it's a minority i think most of the world understands that we have inflation and that's mm -hmm. a really bad thing i think that the politicians have tried to do a good job of blaming corporations for inflation or the other guy for inflation when 
in reality, it's them and their actions and the central bank's actions and the deficits and the stimmies and, you know, the, the money printing that has caused inflation. I mean, there's at any given point in time in the world, there's a certain amount of goods and services and, it, you know, and, and the money that's being used competes for those goods and services, goods and services. And the price is supposed to be the point at which supply and demand get balanced. And the problem is if you increase, if you, you know, vastly increase the supply of the money, then there's more money chasing the same amount of services and the, the price for each service is going to go or good is going to go up. So, uh, it, you know, and, and, but to your question, do people understand it? I, I think that, I think that only, you know, a very small percentage of the people have an enormously deep understanding of it, the way gold bugs and, you know, um, Bitcoin people and, and, you know, Austrian economists understand it. I think a much larger piece of the population understands there's inflation and some of them have a sense that that's the fault of the government, but not all. Yeah. And I think many people are just, you know, clueless and, and don't haven't really focused on the money. And they tend to think that it's more a function of, you know, whether it's blue team or red team that's winning. And so they spend a lot of time arguing over politics. And my view is that both teams stink and that, you know, really it's what, what's what we need is orange team to win. <laughs> so, yes. Right. <laughs> Because sound, you know, I, I, my byline on Twitter is fix the money, fix the world. And, you know, I, I think when I, when I look at the world today at 66 and I compare it to the world I was growing up in in the 70s when I was a teenager, it's a much, it's a shittier world. I mean, it's in some ways it's much better. We have a lot more technology. A lot of things about, are better. But in terms of the civility, the, you know, the, um, you know, the income inequality, um, you know, just a lot of, a lot of other measures, you know, health. Um, you know, in the U.S., we've got a real, you know, drug drug problem of late. Um, you know, it, it was a better world when we had sounder money. Mm -hmm. And by going to unsound money, it, it, it infects, you know, a lot of things, the politics, the, you know, interpersonal relationships, et cetera. So, yeah. um, you know, do I think that a lot of people understand the unsound money is the problem? No. Uh, however, I will say this. Some of us do, and, and those ranks are growing quickly. You know, I, I feel like we might, we, I talked about this on another podcast earlier today. I feel like we might be kind of getting close to that tipping point where, you know, I think once 10% of the population understands something and feels it very strongly and yells about it, then you start to, it's Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. Then, the, then it can go rather quickly, you know, in the right, in the direction of, you know, change. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. I think it's, it's especially in the Western world right and, and you just asked me before we started like oh it's bitcoin for millennials and like one of the <laughs> things i think why i want to focus on millennials also and of course everyone is welcome to listen but we are going to inherit you know this wealth or the money in in the world but and then especially in the western world we never got taught what is money how does this work right. and we never also had the urge to learn it because it just worked right and right. now it's so interesting. Like now I am personally at a point where I understand that my broken money worked because my Western country is still exploiting, uh, you know, Southern countries and Eastern countries. Yeah. And that's why our money still works and their money is broken for tens of years already. Right. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, that just takes some time, especially when, yeah, if you don't have that, the problem in real life um, that your money is not working for you, then yeah, it takes a long time to understand that. But I also agree with you. I don't think we need a lot of people, uh, you know, um, definitely not a majority to realize, you know, the money is broken right. and, and, and it has to, it has to change. Well, and also the issue is accelerating. I mean, if, 
know, we went off the gold standard in 71 and, and it really, we, we tried, we had some serious acceleration from 71 to 80 and, and gold went up, you know, 22 X and there was a lot of inflation monetary debate. And then Volcker slayed that for a while. And the decade of the eighties, this really wasn't a very big issue. I mean, you know, there wasn't that much inflation, um, you know, and, and, but there was some uh, more than was reported. And what's happened is, the problem has kind of gotten, like so many things, it's gotten progressively worse. Mm. And now, in my opinion, we're very close to the point at which it kind of goes critical, you know. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it got worse with the bubble, of the dot-com bubble and the money that was printed when LTCM crashed to get that dot-com bubble to, be, to grow to where it did. Mm. And then it got, you know, uh, more acute when we had the housing bubble, you know, and, and of course, the reaction of the dot com bubble was taking interest rates from you know five six percent down to one percent, and and they almost and there were guys there were Fed people who actually consciously said it. We need to get a housing bubble going to pull this economy out of the dive that we took after the dot com bubble burst, and then you know so that was more money printing, and and you know and and then oh eight came along, and and you know everything was going to fail, and of course they that was real money printing. I mean. Before that, they'd never done quantitative easing. The Fed balance sheet was eight hundred billion. They took it to three point seven or something. So, um, so that was you know, and, and then of course they stopped with the money printing, but they kept interest rates low for a very long period of time. You know, so twenty fifteen we had zero percent interest rates, which in capitalism is really kind of a crime. Mm. You know, if, if the money has no cost or no, you know, if it doesn't cost anything to have money, and money's theoretically free, well, then why is there value to it? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's kind of a tautology. So. Um, and, and that, of course, led to blowing of, quote, unquote, the everything bubble, which is what we now live in, where, you know, the, all this free money. And, and of course, you know, it, 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 you know, that everything bubble, they tried to taper their balance sheet in 17, 18. And of course, in 19, it, it, it blew up on them. The repo blew out and they had to start printing again. And then COVID arrived. And boy, that was the big print, right? I mean, 3.7 trillion balance sheet went to 9 trillion as the Fed. Um, you know, and the money supply you know, exploded 40% in two years. And this is why we've had all this inflation yeah. uh, that we've all suffered through over the last three, four years. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like and each one of these events gets to be bigger, more pronounced and more and more powerful in terms of people's awareness of the problem, you know? And, and so uh, I would submit to you, and there's another one coming, we just know it because the math almost assures it. Yeah, you know, we're, it's we're just math, debt. right? <laughs> yeah, it is just math. Yeah, I mean, we're growing the debt much more rapidly than we're growing the GDP. The yeah. GDP is the earnings power of the of the you know, the economy, and the earnings part of the economy is what's used to service the debt. Yeah, and so this is like a you know this is like a family that you know the 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 breadwinner is only getting you know five or six percent growth per year in his salary, but he's spending 30 percent more a year and his, his, his debt and he's using debt to to, to do it and yeah. eventually you know either the family's going to go bankrupt or they're going to you know in the case of the, our government they're going to print the money to cover the, the the cost because you know if they go they won't let themselves go bankrupt we, we know yeah. that um well, two, so. two things there i think it is about the interest payments are now about 20 percent of Correct. gdp yeah they're, right? they're running at about a trillion yeah, and that's so, a three percent average interest rate on the U.S. federal debt. Yeah. So, as a citizen, when yeah. you work full time five days a week, you are basically working one day a week to help your government pay off their Correct. debt, right? Yeah. And so, when you earlier mentioned, you know, you have, and I like that visualization, right? Like, basically, you have two buckets. One bucket is the bucket where all the money is in. You know, the units that we use to pay for the productivity of the people and the productivity is the services they provide or the products they create, right? With jobs right. Or, or ventures. And the other bucket is that productivity. Right. But the productivity is limited in a certain sense. You it know, is it, it is, yeah. it's also determined by the amount of people that are actually working, et cetera, right? right? That's why birth rates are so important. And then you said, like, if you grow the bucket of the units of the currency then you will you basically it's not in an equilibrium anymore right, right. so then you have to pay more units of that currency for the same right. amount of productivity so products or, or services right and 
I think that's a great visualization for what inflation is. Like you just pay more units of the same thing. Right. But that doesn't mean that the product or the service or that productivity became more valuable. It's the other way around. It's the units became less valuable, right? That's exactly right. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, in, in, in the, the, the currency became less valuable per unit yeah. because, yeah. you know, the amount, of, the amount of productivity is what it is. And but yeah. if you've got more currency units chasing it, each unit buys you less. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah I like to a, say, uh, I like to say units because people, when they think of price, they think of value. Right. right. So when, when you say prices go up, they think, oh, the banana is more valuable. No, right? same banana. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just costs you more. Yeah. Because the money's been debased. Yeah. And so I don't have a background in economics and finance, right? But if I hear, for example, Safe Dean say, like, um, economics is basically a social study, right? It's yes. about how we. Um, trade trade with each other. Yes, that makes. I, I'm not so. I'm not poisoned by other like economic uh, point of views, right? So if I hear that, I think like, oh, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if yeah. you and I meet, and I need something that you can, you know, create or 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 service me for, then we shake hands and we agree upon, you know, whatever the value is, right? Sure. And so that is the social part, I think, of it. But why are there then people who think they can engineer human behavior? Like how, where do these people well, get their ideas from? How does that yeah, work? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, this, I mean, governments and economists and, you know, um, we, we've, we've gone down a lot of the wrong roads in terms of how we're running the economy. And, you know, the, the, you know, when we, when, when we went off the gold standard in 1971, Richard Nixon said, well, we're all Keynesians now. And, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about the flaw in the Keynesian model. The, the Keynesian model kind of believed that what you do is growth at any cost. And, um, and all you wanted to do was continue to grow. And, um, and therefore, when economies slowed down, it was incumbent upon the government to step in and provide the stimulus necessary. And he used the word to rekindle animal spirits. And, you know, he was Keynes and, and all the economists of his ilk, including Ben Bernanke and others, you know, they, they were all reacting to the Great Depression, which was kind of the, the holy grail of, of economics, you know, things blowing up. And, you know, they, they said, what, rather than recognize that the Great Depression was caused by the fact that they blew a, an enormous asset bubble by, you know, when the Federal Reserve was established, it kept rates way too low, bailed everybody out um, and grew the money supply too rapidly. And of course, led to an enormous bubble in stocks and the crash in stocks. You know, rather than interpret that as we shouldn't have had a Fed and we shouldn't have let that bubble form, they interpreted that as, oh, that was all normal, but we didn't react strongly enough once the bubble burst. We should have printed more money once the bubble burst, and then that would have solved the problem. And, you know, I mean, if, if printing money made a country rich, you know, Venezuela or Zimbabwe or, you know, Weimar, Germany. I mean, you know, printing money does not make a com country rich. In fact, it ultimately ruins a country by ruining the currency. So, yeah. um, you know, this, this is a very flawed model where Keynes is trying to, you know, print money to keep things growing. And what we really don't need is growth. We need efficiency. And in classical economics, the way this works is the interest rate is the price of money. Mm -hmm. And interest rate should be set by the balance of supply and demand of savers and investors. So if I save money because I've earned, you know, if I've earned some money and I have some savings and say you're an entrepreneur and you say, you know, Larry, I want to build a business, um, you know, will you, but I, but I don't have the money to do it, but I know if you gave me some money, I could build that business. Will you lend me some money? I would say, yeah, I would evaluate you and the idea and the business, and everything else. And we'd, we'd agree on an interest rate. It would balance the risks and, you know, and, and or maybe we do it in equity. But generally speaking, I'm just keep it, <laughs> keeping it simple, keep it to the debt model. We would agree on an interest rate that balanced the supply and demand of savings against the supply and demand for investment projects. <laughs> and that would be determined by the marketplace. So, but as we all know, the interest rates are not determined by the marketplace today. The interest rates are determined by the Federal Reserve. Hmm. And the Federal Reserve controls the discount rate 
and they think they're better than the market, you know, at setting the price of money. And I mean, this is ridiculous because this is like, you know, the, the Politburo back in Russia in the 60s and 70s or 50s, 60s and 70s, they would set the price of grain. If they set it too high, um, you know, they, they ended up with, um, you know, way too much grain. If they set it too low, they ended up with no grain. And, you know, you, you, can't, you can't have central planning um, of prices. It just doesn't work. You, you know, the way, the way economies should work is prices should be set by balancing supply and demand. And the interest rate price should be set by the balancing of, you know, the supply of savings is against the demand for investment. And the, the, the government and the central bank should have absolutely nothing to do with it. It should be out of the picture. Yeah. Um, but because we got away from that, we've created this enormous boom, buffs, Keynesian cycle and this, this monetary Rube Goldberg machine, which is kind of out of control. <laughs> and, and, and we keep, you know, doing these bigger and bigger swings. And, you know, eventually we're going to, one of them is going to be so big, the whole thing's going to blow up. Yeah. And uh, I think we're getting closer to that, you know, witness the growth in the Fed's balance sheet, witness the you know, inflation that we're experiencing, et cetera. Um, I think that, you know, they're going to have a very hard time containing, you know, the problem they've got because we've now gotten to the point where, you know, these, these geometric functions are compounding very, very rapidly. Yeah. And, you know, anybody who knows math and understands, you know, compounding of a series of numbers recognize that eventually it goes asymptotic almost vertical yeah and um and so you know we're, we've, we've got we've got we're right in the in my opinion we've got and are right in the middle of a very severe debt crisis and most of the world has not woken up to that yet and as more and more of the world does wake up to that yet or does wake up to that fact they're going to become more aware that what they need to do with their savings is to save money in things that the government can't print yeah so the government can't print bitcoin the government can't print gold the government can't print silver the government can't print real estate and the government can't print apple stock so um but you know the government can print bonds they, they issue bonds and the bondholder is the sucker at the table they're going to lose a lot of money because mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of inflation uh, in this in this hyper you know this, i mean as i say they, they're printing and because of the way the cycle works, every cycle they have to print more. And yep. it gets worse and worse and worse and worse until eventually the whole thing blows up. And so, and I, so I, my personal view is the whole thing will blow up probably in 2030, sometime between 2030 and 2035. Hmm. You know, we got a few more swings back and forth, but we're headed in that direction. Yeah. So, so when I, maybe this is a dummy question, but a dummy question is it's good, That's I think. Fine. No, there's no, there are no dumb questions. No, no, exactly. But I think when I think rationally about it, when you talked about the wheat, right? There mm -hmm. is a base layer uh, demand for wheat, right? Yeah. So why or grain or whatever, right? Any, any, any commodity, right? Why do you need to influence that with certain settings of prices, etc.? Like it just that doesn't make sense to me, right? And when you say these people want growth at all costs, it feels for me they are talking about price, right? right? They are talking about units, and so, uh, and as we previously just said, like it's not that's not value; that's just amount. That's just that's nominal just the, yeah, that's just the numbers, price, right? The sticker exactly. price is not the underlying units, right? Yeah, exactly. So these. These, these people are lying to themselves, right? Well, that's like right. from the core, from the start of of how they see an economic system. But as you right. said, they then use these arguments like we have to go back to what did you say about certain motivation, like nature's uh, what? Oh, you, animal spirits. Yeah, that was animal a, spirits. That was a phrase that Keynes used, and and others have used that said, you know, animal spirits were dead in the depression. We should have printed more money. You know, and, and that's yeah, they're, but, they're, but it's so it sounds so weird to me that you would like incentivize natural like motivation to to create or contribute value right. based on a set of numbers or something like it, it just it, it doesn't make well, sense thing, to me. The other thing they said is they said wages are sticky, and, and I mean here here's one thing that does argue in their favor. I mean not not in their favor, but one part of their um, people feel better when quote unquote number goes up. So in other words, if you if you own a house and there's a lot of inflation and every year the value of your house goes up, you know, it might not, it's the same house, right? Each mm -hmm. year. 
but the price of it's going up because there's inflation. That makes you feel good, right? I mean, I have this asset that's nominally going up in value. Yeah. In real terms, it might not be going up in value at all because it's you know, it's just an inflation effect. But same thing with wages. I mean, if you're if you're a worker and you live in an inflationary world, um, you know, if you know, one year you're making thirty thousand dollars and the next year you're making thirty five thousand dollars, well, I got a raise. Now it may turn yeah. out that everything you buy, <laughs> yeah, and that's good, right? Yeah. It may turn out that everything you buy, and what is that? I, I, that's like fifteen percent raise. Except that maybe everything you bought just went up twenty percent. So really, in terms, in real terms, you're actually behind. Yeah. But the point is, the, the, the human beings and human minds like to see the numbers go up, right? And and in a really sound money system, the numbers wouldn't go up as much, but but you'd have a slightly different situation. Yeah. Um, your wages might be flat, but the cost of everything you buy would be falling in down. price. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You'd have a, you'd have a more deflationary outlook. So that you know, okay, so so instead of making thirty five, you're making thirty. But because of all the, the, the productivity and the sound money and the transparency that's taken place, you know, you used to go and, and buy, you know, hamburger for five dollars a pound and you know things have gotten more efficient and now hamburger's four dollars a pound. So your thirty thousand yeah. goes further than it did before. So it's kind of an adjustment of mindset that people have to get used to. You know, the, the way the world will look on a sound money standard. I mean, if, if you go back and study the eighteen hundreds, I mean it's really kind of amazing actually. I mean, there were, you know, you look at the price of like, you know, in fact, somebody ran up, there was a presidential campaign when said, you know, what this world needs is a good 10 cent cigar because, um, you know, cigars cost 10 cents for a long, long, long period of time. And then there was a burst of inflation and they went up to 15 or 20 cents. And of course, everybody hated the inflation. And so a guy ran, I can't recall the guy's name, but I should look it up. I can Google it, find it. But, you know, right, you know what, what this, what this country really needs is a good 10 cent cigar, which was a you know, kind of a, a, a casual way of saying, you know, we got to stop inflation. You yeah. Know, I, mean, I mean, I mean, truly, there were there were things that you look at the price of a lot of things in the 1800s. They didn't change. The price was the same. But what happened is people got much more efficient and they earned more money. So their living standards went up greatly. I mean, the, one of the greatest increases in living standards in the world occurred during the Industrial Revolution from kind of 1800 to, you know, 1940. I mean, I, you know, it just... We, and it was a lot of things. It was a technology, it was cars, radio, you know, yeah. et cetera. But the, but the point is that, you know, I mean, in, in the 1800s, you know, a lot of the world were kind of poor dirt farmers. I mean, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't, except for unless you were a feudal lord or had, you know, a huge landowner or royalty, um, you know, most people were kind of scraping it by, scraping by, you know, in the early 1800s. Whereas by, you know, the early 1900s, you know, most people, not most, not not everybody, but a lot of people had three squares and a house over their head. And, you know, they were they were they were living OK. So, yeah. And, and, so, and that was that was during a period where monetary inflation was extremely low, you know, with a, with a brief exception of the Civil War, where they printed a lot of greenbacks and kind of messed things up. But, so when you were 12, what did the bread cost? I don't remember bread. I'll tell you the number that was very meaningful to me, though, because I remember it very clearly. I used to buy it all the time. Um, gasoline when I was a kid was 25 cents a gallon. So, yeah. yeah and right? so why yeah. is it a joke? Well, let's take the gas. Right? Like, why is it a joke when people say like, oh, the bread used to be 25 cents. Oh, the gas used to be 25 cents, right? Like the, th this is the entire point. I think also Jeff Booth makes, right? The fact that if you agree to the rational argument that if we improve technology, prices should fall. They should, they should fall. Yeah. And a bread is now five dollars. I don't know about a gallon of gas, but isn't this what we should like explain to people that the entire point is we were? It's like we are going back in time, like yeah. very far away in, in yeah. time, right? Because well, uh, yeah, the, the, we already big, had a quarter biggest, of bread. The biggest thing, and, and and this is where I think there's so much anger in the world, and I understand it, is that you know living standards would and will improve. You know, the sounder the money is the more likely, you know, the right signals get sent mm. and the right things get done and the economy works better. I mean, unsound money finances the wars. I mean, the United States spent trillions of dollars on useless wars. I mean, imagine if those trillions of dollars had been invested in education or nuclear power or, you know, yep. just infrastructure. Do you know what I mean? I mean, um, the unsound money has all these terrible incentives and you see people you know, gambling and, you know, doing very speculative stuff. There's, there's not, 
you know, the, the, if, if, if things are priced correctly, people will make, make the right economic decisions. They don't get misled into yeah. doing the wrong thing. And yeah. so, and, th and that's, you know, an economy is all about efficiency. I mean, what we, what we all want to do is we all want more and we want it to cost less. And the, we have the greatest chance of having real efficiency when we have money that's sound because it allows people to plan and think and coordinate. I mean, you know, I, I like the, the model. I mean, it's like, you know, if you were a builder and you were building a house, you know, you obviously use a tape measure, you know, to, to measure the dimensions of the house and this, that. I mean, imagine if the tape measure is shrinking or growing 5% a year, like because of inflation, you know, how's that house going to get built? It's just, I mean, it's, it's just not, yep. I mean, you've got, you need to have standards. And, you know, people make economic calculations based on standards. And if they don't know what the money is going to be worth and if they're or if they're afraid that it's going to continually be worth less, you know, they'll end up making the wrong choices. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a little hard to get your head around. But if you study it, you know, in depth, as I have for a long period of time, you can really see that it's kind of a core issue. Yeah. It's sound money. You know, and, and it's and like I say, I, I don't think that most of the world doesn't understand it. But I think that I sincerely believe and I think those of us who've studied it, the Austrian economists who study it will tell you that <coughs> sound money would go a long way to solving a lot of the world's ills. It yeah. really would. It would provide the right incentives. And, um, you know, and it would probably be anti-war. I mean, you know, I mean, part of the reason I mean, the government's running huge deficits. You know, so we're paying in the United States. I'm sure it's true in Holland, too. I mean, it depends. If you live in a high tax state in the United States, and you're in the, you know, you're doing well, you're making good money. You're probably paying half of what you make to the government. Yeah. And then the other half is probably getting debased at 10 to 15 percent a year with inflation. Yeah. So, and it's so cr crazy. And we, all, right? we all know the government really does. The government doesn't produce anything. Mm. And the government just, you know, sits there and it's a leech. I mean. They, they do do one thing that I think is actually very, very important. If I were to, you know, if I were king of the world, I mean, I would, and I had a chance to set up government. We, we need a government to have a system of laws and courts and regulation. I mean, somebody's got, you know, to me, there's one role for the government, and that's to be the referee. So yep. that, you know, criminals get put in jail and the laws get followed and the courts determine who's a criminal and all that. And, and, and you know, and maybe, maybe natural defense, assuming that there are some bad actors in the world. But I think over time with sound money, the bad actors will go away. And you wouldn't have to spend as much money on national defense. And so, you know, but my, my sense is that, you know, probably 10% of all our incomes, we could have a really good police force, really good courts, really fair judicial system that kind of keeps the playing field level so that yeah. nobody can cheat. Yeah. And that's the role of government. If, if you yeah. had that and, and imagine, think about it, you know, look at yourself, look at how much money you make. Imagine if suddenly all that money you paid in taxes, you, you didn't have to pay that. You only, you know, you make what you make today, but only 10% of it went to the government. The rest was yours. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, that alone, I mean, your living standards would go up substantially, right? Yeah. And it's uh, so fascinating, again, for someone without an economics background, my rational thought goes to when you, uh, and by the way, when you say sound money, right, for also the people listening, sound money is money that is hard to produce. Correct. Right? So that is if, right. and when it's limited, hard in, to, limited in supply or exactly. with a low stock yeah. to flow ratio. Yeah. So it's hard to produce and therefore it's scarce, right? right. In my rational mind, I initially go to, well, if it's hard to create, it's also hard to obtain. So I am forced to deliver enough value. So someone else that would be my customer or my boss for a job would actually part ways with that sound money, right? So th there you immediately create the incentive to actually deliver value, right? Whereas on the other side, the, the soft money that is easy to create, if you have a job, as you just mentioned, right? And you know that half of that goes to the government, why would you add value to that job? Right. Like why, why yeah. would you not be, I don't know how to call that. Like they call those people like a tourist, right. Or like some yeah. people just, you know, they, they flow through life without, you know, not doing anything of value, which of course is a pity just, you know, for your existence in a sense. Right. But that is sure. what that money incentivizes. It, it disincentivizes adding value basically. Right. Because yeah, you know, it's there's certainly some of that. Yeah. There's certainly some yeah. of that. And also, you know, I think I agree with I agree with what you said. Like, what what could the role of a state be? And therefore, I don't think most people would be against uh, 
paying taxes, right? Because uh, if the government gets paid taxes in that hard money, they have to deliver value or else people will not pay anymore, right? That makes a lot of sense well, for me. Well, that's right. And, well, and yeah. as I said earlier, the inflation is a big hidden tax. I mean, it's not just the taxes we pay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's after. <laughs> yeah, right. The inflation diminishes everything else. So yeah. it's, you know, and, and, and I mean, imagine, you know, and this is why I think it's anti-war. Imagine a world where, you know, the government, you know, they couldn't finance wars through inflation. So they, you know, hey, we want to go have a war. You know, your taxes are going to go up 35%. Mm. Well, my sense is that the voters would say, you know, yeah, screw that. Yeah, I'm not parroting ways yeah, with my heart. I don't want to have money. a war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. You're going to grab yeah. 35% more of my income? Forget about it. I'm not interested in that. So you know? when when people say, you know, if the government can print money, why would you pay taxes? Is that well, funny? Exactly, Does it make sense? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the whole point. Mm. Yeah, that's the whole point. I mean, and, and, and by the way, we're getting a lot closer to that point. I mean, the COVID thing in the United States, I think it was true in your country as well really tested that. I mean, I, you know, I know wealthy people got these PPP loans. I mean, everybody got a stimulus check. I mean, you know, sadly, a lot of that money went to places it didn't need to go. And, you know, they printed trillions of dollars and, you know, gave every family, I don't know, a $1,400 check or something. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. and yet they were bailing out companies with millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, the, the system is very broken, very crony capitalist. I mean, you know, the other thing about that we haven't really talked about is the way that the, the money gets made. And the way that they, you know, they keep these interest rates artificially low, what that leads to is contillionaires. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you're on Wall Street and you can borrow at 0% and you take your money and you go put it into an asset that yields you 10 or 15%, well, that's a license to print money. I mean, that's a license to get rich. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like nice work if you can get it. The problem is you and I can't go and borrow at 0%. You know, our credit cards, they charge you 18% or 20%. And yeah. it's, it's the big, powerful vested interests that are able to go to the Federal Reserve and borrow money at a very, very low rate. That's and, what James Carlyle said, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why <laughs> we that's why we've had this enormous growth in, in wealth, you know, disparity. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, the CEO of one of the big auto companies lived down the street from us and you know, I don't know, the guy on the line was probably making fifty thousand a year and I don't know, that CEO was probably making two hundred and fifty thousand a year. So he's probably making five times as much money, but you know, I think today, if you did those same numbers, the guy in the line is probably making eighty or a hundred thousand a year. He's a pretty high skilled line worker. That CEO is probably making forty five million dollars. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's 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 just. I mean, the people the people who are running the system at the top are just robbing everybody else. Yeah. You know, because because they're closer to the money spigot. So. And again, a rational thought, right? Like that guy on the line is probably expending more energy than the men than the, than the CEO. Right. So, if, well, yeah, if, I mean, they, they both got different skill sets. I mean, yeah. you know, but they're, you that's know, true. I mean, they're, they're, you know, a good CEO, but not that is, worth, disparity. A good CEO <laughs> is worth what you're paying them. But the point is that, you know, I mean, there are a lot of other pieces of that, too. That CEO has got stock options and mm. stock options are inflated because they're doing buybacks and they're using leverage and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's so many, you know, this fiat money has led to so many games. I mean, I'll give you a good example in the United States. General Electric used to be one of the finest companies in the United States, right? It was around, you know, I mean, it was founded by Thomas Edison, right? It was around for 100 plus years. And, you know, they were great in all of the industries they were in. And then, you know, a couple of CEOs got in there who were financial engineers and they levered the shit out of it. And they gave themselves a lot of stock options. And the last guy, Jeff Immelt, you know, made six, seven hundred million million dollars on his stock options. And the company's a shell of its former self. It's highly leveraged and, you know, in debt, the stock has performed poorly. And yeah. I know GE retirees who've had their retirements whacked back because the company's done so poorly. So, you know, and, and that's, that's just an example, but that, that's kind of an example of the fiat incentives and how they've let people game the system in their own favor. I mean, it's nice for just Immelt, he, you know, he's building a $15 million house on Nantucket, but you know, what about the what about the guy who worked his whole life at General Electric and thought he was going to have a pension that was going to be worth X dollars and instead it's worth 0.4 X dollars? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and, yeah, sad, and sad. that's that that's just one example. There, there are hundreds of those hundreds yeah. of those. I mean, the system think, is uh, just. Yeah. And that's and by the way, that's why the electorate is just so in the United States is so completely and utterly pissed off. And I can't blame them. I mean, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's unfair. What's happened is incredibly unfair. 
And the, the problem is the sad part of it all is, is that, you know, the right to be pissed off, but they don't, they don't really understand the base problem, the, the cause of the base problem. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and that's where it, I think it's incumbent upon Bitcoiners and sound money people, you know, to try and educate them that if they really want to solve this problem at the base, they've got it. We've got to fight for a sound money, a sound money standard, you know? Yeah. Maybe as a last example of this topic, what I like is uh, if you go to tradingview.com. Oh, yeah. And you look up the Nasdaq and you put it in the USD, then it's probably all time high somewhere oh, yeah. around, right? Yeah. And so, as we talked about, that is the price, right? The amount right. of units, but not right. the value. And Correct. then if you didn't, if you denominate the Nasdaq in M2, which is the money supply, so the amount of units, then yeah. you see, and that's wild, that the value of the Nasdaq now is lower than at the height of the dot com bubble. Oh, is but that we right? can, I, haven't, I haven't done that yeah, chart. Let, it doesn't surprise me. Look that up, yeah. yeah but rationally, surprise. we would yeah. disagree, right? We would disagree. Sure. Like, obviously, we have better technology than at the height yeah. of the dot-com bubble. Of course we do, yeah. But the yeah, value and, is and, lower. And, and again, that, that goes to the whole number goes up, right? I mean, people feel really good about that NASDAQ number. But what they don't realize is, you know, that's why they're paying, you know, much more for everything they buy every day because of the monetary inflation. Oops, Bram, I can't hear you. Did you, uh, are you, uh, did you hit mute? Accidentally muted myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you studied this a lot, right? But who, yeah. who or what has been most influential in like shaping your views oh, about well, like, I'm, money I'm the risk? Economists. I mean, von mm. Mises and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but I would say that, you know, I think the one book that I give out to a lot of people, and I think it's a very good primer on the, subject and then it takes you into bitcoin is and i really do think it's a book that has changed and will continue to change the world and that is the bitcoin standard by Seyfedin amos i mean i think i think that's kind of that ought to be must reading for every student of economics politics etc you know it just it yeah. very crisply lays out everything you and i have discussed with a lot of numbers and support and um you know and then it and it also does a nice job then of, of segueing into what you and i both know is the solution which is bitcoin um, yeah. And so that's the Bitcoin standard, Seyfedean Amos. I mean, I, I, I think it's a book that will change the world. It's been one of probably one of the most important economic books written in the last 20 years. And so I, I feel like absolutely everybody has to read it. And yeah. when you read it and you understand it, you really can't unsee it. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, oh, I get it. And, you know, you, you, you get to where you are and where I am, which is, all right, this is the problem and this is how we're going to solve it. Um, and. And the good news is, I mean, I'm complaining about all this stuff and talking about how broken it is, but I'm actually quite optimistic that we are going in the right direction because our numbers are growing. The, the Bitcoin value is going up. There are more people coming into Bitcoin. I mean, and, and the, the existing Keynesian monetary system is in the process of failing. And as a result of the fact that it's failing, you know, it will be replaced by a much better system. So, you know, the, 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 the failure will have bumps in it and it may not be entirely pleasant for any of us, yeah. but, um, but we can get, you know, we'll get to the other side and I'm quite optimistic. My kids are, I have three kids. They're all in their twenties. We can get to the other side. I'm quite optimistic that we will in the next five or 10 years. And that when we do, the world will look a lot better and that, you know, my kids' futures will look much more, you know, the way I felt my future was in the seventies. I mean, there's some bad things going on in the seventies of the Vietnam war particularly, but other than that, 70s were a very hopeful time in America. It was a, it was a good, you know, there were a lot of baby boomers. We were all, you know, there was a big middle class. You know, nobody was super rich, but we were all getting by. And uh, it was a, you know, it was a nice time to be an American. Yeah. Um, and I think we've lost a lot of that. And for, before we jump into the topic of, of Bitcoin, what is your definition of wealth and why should millennials care about it? Well... So probably at the top of the list is your physical health, um, because if you don't have your physical health, you don't have anything. So I think that, you know, as you know, I'm kind of a workout freak. I, I think that, you know, you get given this one body and you got to take care of it. Um, and, it, it, you know, when you're young, that's not as important because you've got a lot of leeway in terms of, you know, you're just you're young and strong and everything's going in your direction. But I, I tell you, and you're quite young, but when you get to be 50, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're faced with making a lot of choices and you can either decide you're going to work hard to stay in shape 
which I think will then make your 60s, 70s, and 80s pleasant. You can decide you can just let yourself go. You're going to find uh, a lot more discomfort, you know, in terms of you know, just, you know, knee replacements and just all kinds of stuff. So, so I, I would say the first thing about wealth is, um, you know, physical health. Um, I'd say the second thing is just uh, personal freedom. You know, being in a country, in a place where you can do what you want, you're not censored, you can speak freely. And for all of America's faults, it's pretty good on that score. Um, you know, so I think I think that counts as wealth. I mean, living in North Korea, it'd be pretty hard to feel wealthy, no matter how much money you had. Um, you know, and then beyond that, obviously, you know, um, dollars and, and currency and, and that, you know, they what they provide you with, in my opinion, is... I mean, wealth is only good insofar as it can provide you with experiences and, uh, you know, to take care of your family, take care of your loved ones, do stuff that's meaningful, work on projects that you believe in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, I mean, and, and I really, I guess above all of these, the ultimate form of wealth is time, you know, because we all have limited time on this earth. And so we all have time preferences and, you know, somebody who's 20 with no money is arguably wealthier than somebody who's 90 and loaded. Right. Because they've got, you know, a lot of runway to, yeah. to live their life. And the 90 year old has a limited runway. So, um, but. That's yeah, the idea exactly. of uh, time so, billionaires. Um, you know, and so those who are young, you know, enjoy it and, uh, you know, use your time wise, wisely and, and realize that, you know, you're born in a, for all the problems in the world, you were born in an age with just incredible technology and incredibly good stuff going on. Incredible yeah. opportunities, et cetera. Now, you got to figure out how to play your cards and you got a lot of lessons to learn that you'll only learn by, you know, making mistakes, right? And uh, so, you know, get out there and make mistakes and get in the game. But, uh, you know, and, and you know, try to, try to learn. I mean, you don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. You can ask people who've been through it before what they learned and recognizing that, you know, um, there's, there's knowledge, you know, when somebody who's older tells you something and they learn the hard way. I mean, maybe you don't learn it quite as well if you don't learn it the hard way, but I mean, I'll give you an example for me. <clears throat> um, you know, I drank a lot when I was younger and, you know, I realized that wasn't taking me in the direction I wanted to go in. And so at 35 or mid thirties, I just quit drinking and I, I haven't drank since then because it just, it doesn't really serve nice. you know, my interests. And, uh, you know, I've tried to convince all my kids to do the same, and they and they're not. They, they drink still, but I think over time they may they may come to where I am on this. I mean, just uh, I want to be healthy, and um, you know, substance abuse is not something that I think goes along with being healthy. So, um, and I know a lot of other people my age who've come to the same conclusion. I think it's you know I, I highly recommend it, but um, but that's not to say I didn't drink in my twenties and thirties. I did so. So I, you know, that, I mean, you yeah. know, monetary wealth, I mean, that's so, the last form of wealth. And that's, it's great. Uh, I mean, what, what it gives you, it gives you freedom, it gives you the ability to control your circumstances, yeah. to help others, to, you know, to, to be, to live in a way that's, you know, that you, that's comfortable. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't think we we're all put here to suffer. Um, you know, I, I think we need to have discipline and be prepared to suffer you know, when it comes to things like staying in shape, but, um, or, you know, being demanding of ourselves to, to perform well, because I think, you know, we're all put here for a purpose. And so we've got to, we've got to live out our purpose in the best way we can, you know, and, and that's what our legacy would be. Well, you know, what, 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 what did that life mean? You know, what did you do? So. Yeah. I agree. Thanks for sharing that. And well, a legacy part, I think is of course, Bitcoin, yeah, I think sure. it's a nice uh, segue into, into Bitcoin. So I've tweeted repeatedly about the fact, you know, that understanding Bitcoin is not <laughs> about intelligence. And yeah. I saw you liked a tweet too that said, Bitcoin is not a test of someone's intellectual capability, but a test of someone's humility, humbleness, and ego. And to me, you know, like people like, like you, for example, and like uh, Bob Burnett, also James, you know, like a little bit older, but people who are, you know, successful in a money system that we now understand is broken. Like people, people like you who did like a 180 in their understanding yeah. and beliefs like on money and, and well, what we just talked about, right? And, and now see Bitcoin, like for me, that's the highest signal because I know that like that 
everyone in Bitcoin goes through that personal journey. But I think it is a little harder the older, when you're older you, you set in your get, ways. The harder a lot it of my is. friends have been extremely yeah. successful in a fiat world in a fiat sense. And um, they just can't wrap mm. their arms around this and it threatens them. And it's, you know, it's, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's outside of their level of understanding. And, you know, and they want to force it to, to fit into their world model. And, um, you know, nobody forces Bitcoin to do anything. I mean, you just, you just have to kind of understand it and accept it. It, yeah. it is what it is. And, um, and so, you know, I, and I've always told a lot of people and a lot of them came at it being very skeptical and, and somewhat rightly so. I get it. I mean, FTX, I think, scared a lot of people. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's all that stuff is just scam shit. You know, I mean, Sam Bankman-Fried did Bitcoin a big disservice. It delayed the adoption, in my opinion, by multiple yeah. years. But, you know, once you sit down and really spend the time to, to read it and understand it and think it through, you know, um, you can change your mind. It becomes obvious. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, to his credit, you know, Saylor will every now and then he'll retweet his 2013 tweet where he said he thought Bitcoin was a scam. You know, and I mean, it, it, so he's exactly. a smart guy. Yeah. He looked at it, he thought it was a scam, but he kept reading, kept thinking, kept analyzing it. And, and he came back and he said, you know what? I was wrong. I misread this thing. Um, and that, you know, that to me, yeah. um, I mean, a superior intellect will change their views and change their position when presented with contradictory evidence and we've now got a lot of contradictory yeah. evidence i mean i was wrong in 2013 i thought it wasn't going to work i thought you, yeah yeah so what well what, for me what did you have um, to challenge what were your I was very much, you I, I got what it was i got that it was sound money and i think sound money is a good thing and i was an austrian economist i mean i, I got all of that in my particular case, um, I was mm. an investor in technologies from 19, early 1980s to 2005. I invested in all kinds of computers, distributed tech, you know, the, the dot com bubble. I did well with that. Um, and, um, you know, I'd been around computers enough, and I wasn't a computer scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I invested in them and I knew enough about computers to recognize that computers were somewhat unstable. And back in the old days, you know, IBM PC used to go blue screen and and what did you do when your computer crashed? You just unplugged it and plugged it back in again. And you hope that, you know, you hope that the file you were working on had been saved reasonably, you know, recently or so you didn't lose all your work, right? That happened a lot. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, we've got this, we've got this system where we've got money on a computer and money is like really important. You can't mess with it. It's got to, you know, you don't want to, the computer crashes, you don't want your money to go away, right? And so I, I didn't. I didn't really understand the technical construction. And, and by the way, I'd seen, you know, the etymology, I've got to get the names of all these other types of, of Bitcoin. I'm going to find that chart and print it out. But I didn't really understand that this was different than the prior ones. I didn't understand the halving. I didn't understand blockchain. I didn't understand SHA-256. I mean, all the, all the things that we now know, accept, and understand, I didn't really understand them in the beginning. So I was convinced the technology wouldn't work. And and I was and that that conviction actually was somewhat supported by I went to some of the, uh, uh, I, uh, the MIT Bitcoin meetups and there were a couple of core developers there and I'd ask mm -hmm. them I'd say what do you think about this Bitcoin thing and they said well it's interesting it's good it's kind of working but to be honest with you every time I make a change in the code I think to myself shit I crash the net I'm going to crash the network and I thought to myself shit I mean here's a guy who's a real propeller head PhD comp sci guy working on this monetary system and he's worried about the network crashing and he knows shit that I don't even know. So, you know, I mean, this was before the yeah. forks, this is before the block size wars, this, you know, and I mean, and there were backdoors and problems with it that they actually very fortuitously caught. And so I think if you, you know, I think if you went and I've talked to Adam back, I mean, I think if you went and talked to anybody who's a technologist who's worked on this thing from the beginning, they will all tell you that there were many, many times early on when it was quite vulnerable and it wasn't going to work. And in fact, you had a, you had kids and others who made the mistake, you know, they were mining it or they were involved with it. I mean, and, and they, you know, when it was a dime or, or 20 cents or 30 cents. And they, so they had 10,000 of them and it became worth $2. And, you know, they were in their twenties and, and they said, holy cannoli, I've got, a, I've got $20,000 here. I need a car. And so they sold 10,000 Bitcoin and bought a car. Do you, you know what I mean? And, Obviously, that you know they're going yeah. to experience regret over that for the rest of their life because they didn't really understand you know what it was in terms of the monetary you know medium. But um, you know, so so my problem with it was the technology. But I, you know, it it just was kind of layered, and my my knowledge kept growing, 
you know, the blocks kept going. There were no problems. And, you know, it, it just it, each each block, each year, each technical innovation, SegWit, et cetera, you know, the getting to know some of the core developers and understanding how it all operates. You know, I just watching the nodes grow from, you know, a small number of nodes to what are we, 30,000 plus nodes today? It's a lot. Um, you know, it kind of got me comfortable that, all right, mm-hmm. I now believe that the, the risk of technical, you know, and Sailor coming in, he's a, you know, aerospace, you know, engineer, you know, propeller head, super bright guy, and, you know, it meets his test. I mean, I'm now of the opinion that the risk of a technical failure here is extremely low. I mean, it's not zero, but it's extremely low. Yeah. So. Did you have like a specific aha moment yeah, where you were yeah, like, okay, yeah, now, yeah, you know, now and you know I what like probably turned drove that around. for me more than anything else was price. I mean, so I tried to get in before 2013, but you, you had to go to a cafe and give somebody money, and it all seemed kind of shady. And then I was then I was close to buying some through Mount Gox, and fortunately <laughs> yeah. I, I I would kind of drag my feet, and then Mount Gox failed. So there wasn't any there, and then it, then Coinbase mm-hmm. came out. And I think there had been a run around that time up to a thousand. I thought, oh shit, I missed it. And then there was a correction. It went from a thousand down to three hundred. Oh, okay, I get it. I know how this works. Buy the dip. So I went and bought my first ones at about about three hundred. And <laughs> um, and then it, you know, then I went back to a thousand. I bought a few more. And and then I really got pretty excited about it. I don't know if you were around at the time, but in twenty seven, and I went. To, I kept going to these meetups and stuff and learning. And I was buying it, but not a ton. In 2017, it really launched. It broke out from a thousand and went to seventeen thousand. I was like, "Holy shit! This is... I mean, we have not seen anything like this before. Mm. I mean, this is a big deal." And I was buying it at seventeen thousand, and then it fell back down to ten the next year, and then it fell to four, three and a half for four the next year. And I bought both of those dips, you know, not knowing, kind of thinking to myself, "I think this is right. I think I'm right about this," but I, recognizing I could still be wrong. Um, but I kept buying those dips and then, you know, it just, it kept, you know, I mean, cause I listened to all the talk. It was a bubble. It was a tulip. It was this, that, and I mean, I get it. Um, you know, to me, the, the two risks have always been, does, does the technology blow up? I'm now over that risk in my mind. I don't think the technology blows up. I think the second risk, and I don't see much chance of this, but I think there is some chance is that everybody just loses interest in it. I mean, we need to have growing and continual adoption it needs to like a virus it needs to spread you know suddenly everybody said ah bitcoin who gives a shit yeah you know then that you know that would be that wouldn't be good and and it could kind of die away but you know all the numbers i look at you know you look at the global hash you look at the addresses you look at the wallet downloads a guy last night was telling me i think that some there's a site somewhere that tracks wallet downloads it's like a million a month no no i think it's a million a day the site is saying there are a million yeah, to all the wallets. I don't know how they get that the data. I don't know if it's accurate, but anyway, that's the case. 365 million wallets are hmm. getting downloaded now. Okay. And a planet of 8 billion people. I mean, this is starting to really matter, right? So um, as long as the adoption is continuing, which is what I call dogs eating the food, then, you know, it, I don't see, yeah. I'm kind of hard pressed. And, and it's also, you know, it's also Metcalf's law. I mean, it's, it's a network you know, the more people who join the network, the more valuable the network becomes. And then the more valuable the network becomes, the more people who join. Do, do you know what I mean? It's a, I mean, it's like Google. I mean, think about Google. Yeah. I mean, you know, it started yeah. off as it was a better search engine than the Yahoo, better algorithm. Everyone migrated to it. And, and of course, now, you know, the, I mean, yeah, there's still Bing. And there's some other search engines. But really, if you want to list something or search for something, you're going to use Google because it's the superior network. And that's the same thing here. This is yeah. the superior monetary network. And it's just continuing to grow and embed itself. And it was the first mover. And so I don't really see, I don't really see that, you know, I don't see that much downside. I see, I see a lot of paths that are varying. I mean, you know, as you know, from the show, I mean, Samson thinks it's going to be at a million dollars this year or next year. I mean, will it be? It could be. Um, I'm not counting on it. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think it'll be a couple hundred thousand pretty soon. But, mm-hmm. uh, a million, uh, I think that takes a few more years. but. But I don't know. Nobody really does. I mean, you know, the thing that's interesting about it is, and I've said this on another podcast too, is we've never really seen this before, Graham. This is a, we are, we are living in an experiment because what we have is a commodity that has a fixed supply. And every other commodity in the world, gold, oil, yeah. wheat, corn, you know, anything, um, is, is, it will, the supply will vary based upon the price. 
price goes up, ma mankind will make more yeah. of it. And well, it's the a, supply on this thing, it's yeah. friggin' algorithmically fixed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's it's an experiment, as you said. It's a commodity, yes. but it's it's a digital commodity right. that can also act as money, right? So we have, as you said, we have Metcalf's law, we have the Lindy effect, we have yeah. the Veblen effect, we have Gresham's law. So, like, it's yeah. all these things intertwined, right? And I think that's also why it's well, it's hard to comprehend, but also very hard to predict because. Um, well, you have that right. scarcity, right? You have like stock to flow. And there's a lot of the a lot of debate about stock to flow versus a power law versus this and versus that. But you know, it's fun, I think, to explore. I think that's right. But nobody I think has we're all, we're all just guessing about, about I think, future because prices. It's, we really uh, are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's you know, fun. Like I, everyone likes number go up. I mean, it was fun. so fun when number went down. And and I think one yeah. of the things people have to prepare for yeah. is, you know, I think the drawdowns might become less. I mean, if you look at the historical drawdowns, they've slowly but surely been declining, but not by a lot. But the, the drawdowns might become less as it gets more widely mm -hmm. distributed. I mean, eventually, when it's fully distributed, drawdowns won't be very big at all. But if if there are drawdowns, because it'll kind of fundamentally be money, but that's many years out. And um, yeah. one thing, I, the only caution I would give to people as they look at it is, you know, when you put money into it, you do need to be prepared for the possibility that there'll be a drawdown. You know, I mean, the only people I've seen really get hurt in it are the people yeah. who don't truly understand it. They chase the price at the top. You know, they, they aped into it at 68000 You know, it went to fifteen. They didn't know why they bought it. They freaked out. They sold it, you know, even though we told them not to. And, yeah. you know, they didn't, they didn't realize what they were buying. They didn't understand the volatility and the nature of the asset. And why dollar cost averaging makes sense, and and we you know at, at each cycle it just comes at bigger scale. I mean, you know, I can foresee, and it's a, not a prediction, but I think it's possible that let's say this run we go to four hundred. Well, somebody's going to buy it at four hundred. That might be their first Bitcoin. Well, let's say it corrects. It doesn't correct as much as it has in the past, but let's say it corrects fifty percent, so it goes to two hundred. Well, somebody who bought it at four hundred and that's their first buy, they're going to really feel like shit, you know, because they just on paper they just lost half the money now. Yeah. You know, if they wait five years, it's probably yeah. going to be at a million. So the four hundred thousand dollar buy is going to look fine. Mm. And if they dollar cost averaged into it and said, "Look, I recognize that four hundred is kind of extended. I don't want to go do a plot buy right there. Maybe what I want to do is I want to buy. You know, I have this amount allocated to it, and I want to buy that equally over the next twelve months, two years. You know, and and so if it goes up, I'll be paying a little bit more. But if it comes down, I'll be buying more or less and averaging down. I mean, that's to me, yeah, that's a much exactly. more intelligent way to yeah. approach it. I mean, Phil Miller made a fortune investing in Amazon. Yeah. And uh, he bought it very early, held it, held a big piece of it for a long, long time. And yet he suffered multiple 50% drawdowns where, you know, I mean, people would look at it and say, Jesus Christ, you lost, you know, you had this big markup, you lost half your money. He's like, yeah, but I believe in it. And every time it came back. And that's. Yeah. But that is also that's why we say that's, like, study guess, yeah, Bitcoin, that's, right? That's like, the I think broader you, point that I'm trying to make is people, people listen to this. You, people really need to fully understand yeah. what this thing is. They really do. And and I tell people yeah. we're trying to orange pill other people. I yeah. say so you've got to you've got to explain the risk here. And you've got to explain to them that, you know, mm -hmm. at any given point in time there could be a big drawdown. And if if they think they're gonna get scared out of it, yeah. well then their waiting is too high. I mean look, th if this does what I think it's gonna do. The only wrong allocation of this is zero. And so, seriously, because if you have some, I mean, yes. if it does a hundred bagger, a thousand bagger, yeah, I agree. You know, and you heard about it, and you didn't buy any of it, you're going to real regret. But, but honestly, I think for a lot of people, just having mm -hmm. say, say you've got investable yeah. assets of whatever that number is, ten percent of your investable assets in this thing, if it does what I think it's going to do, it's going to eat everything else. You're going to, and you're going to be really glad you put the ten percent in. And, and the average investor, if you think about it, you probably made a lot. Average investors made plenty of investments over many years. You can lose 10% of your investable assets and recover. You know, I mean, you, you can. You, I mean, if we're totally wrong and it goes to zero, which I think is impossible, but if it does, and you've got 10% of your wor net worth in this thing or 10% of your investable worth in this thing, you know, and it, and, it, and it craps out, you'll be okay. You've still got 90% somewhere else. And what I would say. Well, well I'm 90% exactly. in I mean, Bitcoin. I, I, but... Exactly. I mean, okay. you and I are, you know, we're on the other end of the spectrum. and. <laughs> I'm not quite that high. I'm, I'm, you know, more like 60% yeah. now that the price has gone up and the rest is in gold, but that's just because I have a legacy of, of being a gold investor. So, and as you get older, you need things that are less volatile. Yeah. I mean, 
I've got clients who have $10 million. Yeah. I you know, agree. they they've spent their whole life earning it. They're 70 years old. They're not going to put $10 million in Bitcoin knowing that it could go down 50%. They just can't. But if I, they want to protect against yeah, monetary debasement, I'm like, fine. Why don't you put $4 million in Bitcoin and $6 million in gold? And the biggest drawdown gold ever had was in the 20% range. Mm. And generally speaking, gold is up almost every year. And over long periods of time, it's up 8% a year. So it's much less volatile and you can't print it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. And so when someone says to you, what is Bitcoin and why should I care? Like, yeah. how do you explain it briefly? You, you just said something, which I think is a main point for me uh, uh, in my understanding is you said it's just a thing, right? You said it's just a thing that works yeah. as intended right like the protocol just works as intended it's just chugging along like right. it doesn't really matter what you think of it right is that one of those things like when you yeah, said that I, mean, I was like the yeah, way that's, i define it that's to somebody is i say i say one look, of those first of all things. it's really important to understand that it's a, it's a it's an invention i mean we discovered we created digital scarcity so in looking at it you need to think of it you know Radio is an invention, TV was an invention, cell phones invention, cars an invention, printing print. I mean, it is an invention. Before we had it, we never had digital scarcity. Yeah. Okay. Why does that matter? Well, because money is all about scarcity. You need to have, to have money be good, it needs to be scarce. I mean, you can't have sand as money because there's an unlimited amount of sand. You can't have water as money, there's an unlimited amount of water. You know, and, and through 5,000 years of history, you know, probably one of the scarcest elements on the planet, if not the, it's not the scarcest, but it's because they're small elements are scarcer, but you know, a widely distributed scarce element is gold, right? And so 5,000 years, people determined that gold was a good form of money because it's scarce. The supply only goes up at one and a half percent a year. And, you know, it was the best money that we had, um, you know, until Bitcoin came along and, you know, fiat money is, is vastly inferior. We don't need to go into that, but, um, and so what Bitcoin really is, is it's, it's digital gold, only it's better. And, and the, 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 way, the, way, the reason gold is so good is that stock to flow is very, very uh, high. In other words, there's a huge stock of gold in the, in the world, 200,000 tons. And we only mine, I don't know, 3,000, a little over 3,000 tons a year. So that's like one and a half percent that we increase the supply. Um, in the case of Bitcoin... Right now, the supply increases about 1.5% a year. In about 20 days, we're going to have a halving, and that's going to fall in half. So it's going to be 0.75, you know, three quarters of a percent a year. And then in another four years, it's going to be, you know, half of that. And then, you know, just asymptotically as it approaches zero. And so, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that we've got a better form of money that's sounder than gold on a stock to flow basis. And in value terms, stock to flow is the most important measure for monetary value. So, um, you know, that said yeah, something the about the hardness. It, is the, thing, it right? is the hardest form of money that ever existed. It's also superior to gold in the sense that there's no cost to store it and you can digitally move it, you know, instantly. I mean, Gold costs money to store. It's hard to verify. There's been fake gold. There are fake gold bars that have tungsten inside them. I've sold gold bars to people, and they have to either cut them in half and charge me a resmelting fee, or they have to have the right kind of machine that can look inside to make sure it's really gold. And, you know, by the way, try and take a billion dollars of gold and move it from point A to point B. I mean, you know, you're going to need a, you know, um, yeah. I don't know, a semi truck or a heavy lifting airplane. So, um, and you can move you can move a billion dollars of you know Bitcoin in ten minutes. So, um, so it's got a lot of monetary properties that I think make it better than gold. You know, it is a form of quote unquote digital gold. Um, you know, and 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 the other reason that it's better than gold, and and the thing that I think is going to make it outperform gold, that um, is a really a couple of hedge fund guys. One of the guys, Paul Tudor Jones, very brilliant guy, said, you know, in the monetary debasement race. Bitcoin is the fastest horse. And he's right. I mean, one, the price of gold has been suppressed. That's a whole different long conversation. We don't need to go there. But um, you got two things going on. We know, we talked earlier, the government is debasing the money. We know that. That's a fact. That's provable. You can see M2 growing consistently for year after year. And that's, you know, that's your more supply of money, same number of goods, prices go up. Okay, fine. 
We know that's true. We know that's a trend. We know that trend is getting worse. That will drive the price of everything up. It'll especially drive up the price though of things that can't be printed like gold and Bitcoin. Gold is fully distributed. It's been around 5,000 years. Everyone who wants gold knows what it is, has gold. You know, it's, it's got a huge Lindy effect of having been out there. Bitcoin has been around 15 years and the whole world doesn't know about it yet. And so you've got an, it's cool because you've not only got mm. something that'll go up because the government's printing money and there's monetary debasement, but also you've got an adoption curve, <laughs> you know, and you've got, I mean, what, what, what do we got? 8 billion people, 21 million. I mean, every person in the world can't have even like a 10th of a coin. You've got 54 million um, millionaires in the world. You got 21 million Bitcoin, yeah. some of which have been lost, but forget that for a moment. Every millionaire in the world could only own half a Bitcoin. I mean, right? And so, and and by the way, most of them aren't aware of it yet. And so, you know, we're not even at that 10% tip, 10% tipping point. So, we're just so very, very early, Bram, in terms of acceptance. And you know, the way I tend to look at it is at a macro level. It's about 700 trillion of wealth in the world. That includes real estate. Let's take the real estate out. Let's say there's 350 trillion of real estate, 350 trillion of stocks, bonds, you know, currency, paper, all that kind of stuff, gold. Uh, um, you know, the entire market cap right now, of Bitcoin is 1.3 trillion. So all the Bitcoin in the world is worth 1.3 trillion. All the other stuff in the world is 350 trillion. As that 350 trillion becomes aware that they are being consistently and systematically debased, i.e. that they're losing out to inflation, not all of it, but some of it is going to say, huh, I need to sell this stock. I need to sell these, especially bonds. I need to sell these bonds. I need to take this currency and I need to buy something that's really hard. That's not going to be debased and I'm going to buy Bitcoin now. And as we've seen, you know, there's a real multiplier effect because a lot of the coins are in strong hands. 70% haven't moved in over a year. You know, it, with the, the Bitcoin, since the ETFs came in, ETF comes in and the market value of Bitcoin, I think has gone up by about $300, $300 billion. And I think the Bitcoin, I think there's been about $8 billion that's gone into the ETFs. I could be a little off on this because it changes every day. But let's just think about this. So 300 mm trillion dollars of market appreciate 300 billion dollars that bitcoin's gone up on eight of new flows so that's 37 times so this is the multiplier so that suggests that for every billion dollars that comes into bitcoin the price goes up by 37 times that amount so there's remember there's 350 trillion not billion trillion dollars out there okay mm -hmm. Right. Let's take 1%. 1% of that <laughs> yeah. is 3 trillion. Okay. Yeah. The entire market cap today of Bitcoin is 1.3 trillion. And I can assure you that that entire 1.3 mm -hmm. isn't for sale. Do you, do you follow where I'm going here? So if, if, that, yeah. if that 3 trillion came over and said, you know mm -hmm. what, I want to buy some of this stuff, I got to get it. I mean, this is why the mistake people are going to make with this asset. And I had a friend who did this. I was talking to him the other day. He said, well, you told me about it at 25 and it's at 50 now. I can't, I can't chase it. I can't. And I was like, dude, this thing's going to $2 million. You know, do you care that you're paying 50 grand for something that's going to be worth, and, and then four and then six and then eight. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's got so far to run and we are so early. I mean, we know for a fact that we're under the 10% penetration level and yet it's growing rapidly. And so, uh, you know, as I say in many yeah. podcasts, I've never seen such an asymmetric bet. I mean, I just it's 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 kind of stunning to me that it yeah. exists. And you know, I've been in the business of investing in stocks, and the hardest part about investing in stocks is that you're investing in companies, and companies are run by people, and people people screw shit up. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, sadly, you know, management teams screw things up. And here you've got a really good monetary investment that's kind of on autopilot. You know, you've got the core developers who could theoretically screw it up, but there are a lot of them and anything they do has got to be approved by the consensus. And so I, I think the odds of this thing getting screwed up are pretty damn low. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think I have to convince you because you're a Bitcoiner, you totally get it. But I mean, you know, to me, this really, with my friends and the people I've tried to orange pull, this really is kind of, a, I'm pounding the table. 
you know, and fine. I get it. If you're afraid of it, I totally get it. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that you need to put all your money in this thing. But what I am suggesting is that if you don't buy some of it, someday, five years, 10 years, 15, and you heard about it, and people tried to convince you to do it, and you said, nah, I'm not going to do that. I think you're going to experience regret. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think it's interesting that that right. ego test or like personal right. challenge test comes back <laughs> again, right? Because I think what yeah. you just said, like, some people don't like that sentence, right? We are still so early, but I, I do agree. But that is the, that is what makes it so hard. Like when you see this entirely and then realize how early it is, you start am doubting I really yourself. Here? Yeah. Like, and, and, am I really well, here? And already? the other thing is you like, can, it's very easy exactly. to have FOMO <laughs> yeah. or, you know, revert old time FOMO. And, you know, you know something, I mean, look, I've met people who bought it at $2. I met people who bought it at $1. I mean, Max Kaiser bought his first coins. I was told this story the other day. That was fascinating. He paid 50 cents for his first coin. So there was a guy in front of him named Trace Meyer, who was really early, who paid 30 cents. And Max thought he was overpaying. Max thought he was too oh, late wow. at 50 cents. Okay. I mean, right. I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of, wow. this is where we are. So, you know, I've got coins I bought at 300. I've got coins I bought at 1,000. I've got 5,000, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm totally comfortable buying coins at 69,000. I just don't care. I mean, if I have some excess savings or some earnings or, yeah. you know, other things pay off, I'm going to put them in at whatever the level is at that point in time. Recognizing that at any time, the 69 could go to 30, and I've got to be prepared to live with that. But I am. You know, I am. And so since I am, because I know that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's going to be much, much higher because, you know, as I say, yeah. if adoption continues, um, what's, you know, what's going to stop it, right? So is the risky thing here like losing well, the faith in yourself? That. I mean, I, you know, I think basically, you, right? If the, yeah. Well, or like the understanding, the, you know, the, the trusting yeah. of your understanding, right? And then when it goes down, inevitably, A that bit. you keep yeah. trusting yourself. I mean, I have to yourself, say, when I bought it at 17 right. and it went to 10 and then four, I had some moments of doubt. I mean, I was kind of like, yeah. yeah, I mean, I was like, oh, shit. Of course. You know, you might have really <laughs> yeah. fucked up on this thing. But, but I, but I didn't, I, I went yeah. back to the core thesis and I understood stood the core thesis at base level. And I thought to myself, no, you know, and, and I mean, the benefit everybody has now is how many of these drawdowns we got five or six. I mean, we've now seen this, you know, investments tend to exhibit patterns and we've seen this, we've got pattern recognition. Now we've had a bunch of drawdowns, you know, which, which, which the, the doubters would say, oh, there was a bubble bursting. Okay, but in every case, that bubble burst and then it came back stronger. So it's not a bubble. It's just not. I mean, we've had six yeah. bubble bursts and every time it comes back stronger. So, so really, that's, that's not the right model. So, but yeah, I mean, if, look, if you bought your first coins at 69 three years ago and, you know, FTX happened, I mean, no doubt you felt like shit, you know. Um, but again, the way of you course. deal with yeah. that is you have to take a portfolio approach and you have to take a probability weighted approach. I mean... I was particularly suited to this because I, you know, I went to business school. We studied monetary economics, we studied economics. And, you know, what you do is you, you look at the potential reward. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about this is it's asymmetric. What does that mean? You can only lose one. If you put a dollar into it, you can only lose the dollar. But you can make $10, $100, $1,000, mm. $10,000. Depends on the time frame, right? And that's, a, that's an asymmetric bet. So what you've got to get comfortable is that what you put into it, you could lose it. You've got to get comfortable with that. But but and, and you've got to yeah. you've got to get comfortable that it's worth yeah. the possibility of losing that to, for the for the upside of potentially making four, five, 10, 15, 20, 100 times your money, which I think it still has that upside. I mean, it's interesting. Sailor made a comment over yeah. in um, Madeira that I, I think he met for when he was up on stage. He said, he said, look, the next 10 years are going to really be the gold rush period in Bitcoin because we're at about 90 percent of the coins have been mined to date. And between now and 2034, the next 9% will get mined. So at 2034, 1% of the remaining coins will be mined over the next 100 years as that asymptotically, you know, the halvings occurred. Yes. So effectively at that point, your stock to flow is, you know, there's, there's no flow. I mean, you're getting just a trivial amount of flow. So you're, you're, mm -hmm. all the coins are out there. And so at that point in time, it becomes even harder. 
And, you know, my sense is we're just going to go on an incredible ramp here, you know, during these next 10 years. And people, I think, are going to be shocked at how valuable these things are. And so in the world that I foresee in the future, you know, and this is going to be hard for some people. There are literally going to be those people who bought Bitcoin and those who didn't. And the people who bought Bitcoin are going to be silly rich, just silly yeah. rich in, in fiat terms. And the people who didn't might be really bitter. And, and, and you know, if you can live with that, fine. But if, if, you're, if you're listening to this and you can hear this and you can understand it and you can think it through, you know, I beg you to buy some. Um, and I've, you know, I've orange pilled a lot of yeah. people who are extremely skeptical. They almost had to hold their nose to buy it. They were terrified of it, you know, and, and this is five, six, seven years ago. And to a person, they've all come back to me and said, thank you for pushing me on that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe to reiterate, as you said, in your entire career, I've I don't never know how long that's like been, this, but Brown. you've it's never just, seen it. It's uh, friggin believable. Uh, it almost sounds too good mm -hmm. to be true. And, and it would be too good to be true if it wasn't the case that it was a technical invention. I mean, I'm sure if you had spoken to somebody in America in yeah. 1890 and told them, you know, in 30 or 40 years, you're going to be able to get on an airplane and go from New York to L.A. in four and a half <laughs> yes. hours in a jet. Yeah. They just said, you're out of your fucking mind. That's too good to be true. There's no there's absolutely zero possibility of that. Right. There's just there's zero possibility. Yes. The best I can yeah. do is hop on an overnight train. And I'll end up in California in 36 hours or whatever the hell it is. Right. You know, I mean, and, and that's. Yeah. 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 That's, well, to, that's the, to, that's the yeah. point. That's what we're talking about. We've got a technical innovation here. And so, you know, I mean, I, as I told it's yeah. set up on the stage. I mean, in Madeira, I made the mistake of selling Microsoft. It was the base layer of, of computing. I mean, I didn't know what I owned. You know, I didn't realize it, but. To me, this feels the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the advantages. I started investing in the 80s, early 80s. You know, so what have I been doing? 40, you know, 43 years or something. I mean, um, no more. I mean, yeah, 43 years. So um, 44 years. So, you know, basically, um, this reminds me so much of, you know, the computers and Microsoft as the base layer or of the Internet as the base layer. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. And, you know, is it going to all happen tomorrow? No. It's not going to all happen tomorrow. Is it, is it a relentless trend? Yes. And, you know, that Microsoft stock is up 4,700 times the price I paid it for it in 1986. I wish I'd hung on to it. I didn't. Fucked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe fun, fun for me to share with you. Like when I heard you say this, right, like this is the biggest asymmetric bet I've ever seen or what Greg Foss says, right? Like I've been in Wall Street for 35 years and, you know, I've never seen anything like this. Then at one point I realized when I saw that, you too, I think in one week saying the same thing, I was like, I'm 35. Like, what the hell do I know? You know, like, I think it's interesting because we ended up at the same point of understanding right. this thing called Bitcoin, but you have this life right. experience that right. I don't have, right? So I can go in my head and right. think like, oh, I doubt myself in this or this way. But but when I hear you say that, for me, that's such a signal. It well, says so I mean, much it's, 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 to me, right? Like that that yeah, is information right. well, that and, I can it's use. The advantage. Right? I mean, I've seen a bunch of these cycles. Yeah. I have seen a bunch, and I and I, this is the same, same old, same old. That's why that's why I have so much conviction in it. And I'm not sitting here trying to pump my bags or anything else. I'm I'm actually just trying to help people. Um, you know, to understand it. And I just, it's, yeah. you know, and that's why I have such deep conviction in it. And I, I think that's why Sailor has, I mean, you know, all of us, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of people come to it that way. I mean, yeah, this guy on, uh, on Twitter is a good friend of mine, Chris Irons, who runs Quoth the Raven. I mean, he was a very big skeptic. He was a very smart guy. He was very open-minded, very yeah. open-minded, very, and very smart. Oh my God. He's, he's, he's more totally orange than I am. I mean, it's hole, crazy. Right? <laughs> It's totally crazy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just I like, love it. At I love some to point, it, it yeah, went off right. in his head like, holy shit, you're right, Larry. I think it was actually when I said it was a digital, yeah. you know, we invented digital scarcity. I really think it helps to think of it in those terms. It's not just an investment. I mean, you know, mm. Sailor gets all wonky yeah. in engineering. He says, oh, it's digital energy. Well, what does that mean? No, no, no. This is an invention. This Before this thing came along, it did not exist. Yeah. We had tried multiple times to make it exist, and they failed. Yeah. They failed because the technology was in one way or another flawed. 
But eventually, add them back, and everybody contributed pieces to it, and they all put it together. And we now have an unflawed technology that really gives you digital scarcity. And that's that's a that's a yeah, fundamental exactly. that's, that's... technical development that did not exist before this thing existed. And now we've got 15 years of history. You know, so it's I mean, this is even less. And then Foss and I talk about this a lot. You know, you know, you're paying 69 for it right now. I mean, I'll tell you the buy the buy of all buys was after FTX when I went back down to 15. I mean, hell, I was paying 17 for it in 2017. So here you were six years later and you got a second chance. Do you know what I mean? Unbelievable, yeah. right? Yeah. But, I mean, even at 65, yeah. I look yeah. at it and I think to myself, given how much we know and how, many, how much of the risk we've wrung out of it, I mean, oh my God. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a better bet at 65, yeah. arguably, than it was at 2017 at 17. Um, because we know more about what it is and where it's going. Yeah. I mean, these ETFs, I mean, this is huge, right? So. Yeah. And, and what you said about the digital scarcity, right? I think also for, you know, when I see my generational oh, peers uh, all into shit coins uh, still, oh, you know, like yeah. I, I try to say, you know, bit, Bitcoin is a decentralized protocol that yeah. represents <laughs> that discovery of digital scarcity oh, and I, crypto, you know, quote unquote, yeah, is I, an I, attempt. I, yeah. No, but it's an attempt by startups to create a technology where some right. token fuels exactly. the use of their totally system, different. right? It's totally different. It's totally so different. different. It's something. And yet, yeah, it's and, not and yet even I get it. I mean, I get bag. how people no. in Web3 and technology, I mean, but that's all very fiat like. That's very fiat like. Yeah. Me too. And this is different. Yeah. Oh, I we dabbled in that as well before. We all, we all did. Uh, I was I mean, already I, into Bitcoin. I, mean, but I always tried it out a couple but now, winners. And then yeah. the more I learned about it, the more I understood about what their monetary policies were, the more I came to the no, you know what? I'm a, mac I'm a mm -hmm. maxi. That shit's not going to work. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Same here. Yeah, yeah. So, last, yeah. Uh, last, last two questions. I wanted to ask you about, I saw you you tweeted about Gresham's law and I wanted to ask like, can we talk a bit about the idea of like Bitcoin replacing fiat currencies? Yeah. Like how does that play no, out? Like knows. how long does yeah, that nobody take? Nobody knows and, for sure and how I saw long that it takes. Tweet um, where you mentioned that. The point on those tweets though, was just that in a digital world where everybody's connected, things can happen fast. I pointed out the Silicon Valley bank failed in six days. Mm -hmm. And in one day, the Silicon Valley bank had withdrawals of $45 billion, which is 45% of their deposit base. So, when, yeah, when everybody comes to the yeah. conclusion that fiat currency is doomed, we're going to have a God candle that's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to go to infinity. I mean, there's a chart on um, that my friend Dan Oliver of Mermican has put up. It's all over Twitter that shows the, how the Deutschmark went to infinity in terms of gold uh, in the German hyperinflation from yeah. 1919 to 1923. And, um, you know, at some point in time, I mean, what happened in Silicon Valley Bank is everyone came to the conclusion, this bank is bankrupt. I got to get the fuck out of here now or I'm going to lose all my money. Okay. At yes. some point in time, I sincerely believe that the governments will be doing so much money printing and it will be so out of control that everyone will come to the conclusion that they are, those currencies are doomed and they will be panic buying anything that's not currency and that includes food and cars and houses and but you'll realize that if you have a hundred thousand dollars it's going to buy more today than it'll ever buy in the future and that you've got to get the fuck out of it and so you're going to buy gold silver bitcoin or something tangible because eventually you know it's going to they're going to be worthless and this is how all hyperinflations have happened venezuela zimbabwe etc all it takes for hyperinflation to occur all it takes is for everyone to come to the conclusion that the government can never get responsible again. And, you know, I've already reached that conclusion, but, yeah. you know, I, it's going to take a long time until everyone comes to that conclusion. So what's the time frame for that? I don't know. I think it could be as late as 2038. I kind of tend to think it's probably in the early 2030s. Um, it's a fourth turning. They tend to last 10, 20, 30 years. We started in 2008. 10 years is 2018. Hasn't yeah. happened. 20 years is 2028. 20, Could happen by then. Yeah, it feels to me like we've got a few more, you know, zigzags back and forth. By 2038, this is going to be all over. It's it's just going to be obvious. So, but I, you know, I, I could be surprised. I mean, if, you know, yeah. 
if Samson's right and, the, and we go to a million bucks, you know, in the next year or two, I mean, that's going to be a wake-up call. That's going to be a big wake-up call. And then the other thing is, how's the other side going to play it? How much money is the government going to print? Are they going to try and ban it? Are they going to throw sand in our eyes? You know, I, I mean, it, it will be existential. I mean, it, you know, it, it, we're playing for all the marbles. When we're playing, when we're playing for what is the world's reserve currency that people trust, we are playing mm. for all the marbles. And yes. that's how big it is. But this is how big it is, right? This is yeah. how, how big it is, especially, I think last week, there was a tweet from the European Central Bank about Bitcoin. And I tweeted like, the fact that they pay attention to some random idea getting thrown out on the internet 15 years ago, yeah. like that is right. the signal. Like, why do you know how many random ideas there are yeah. on the internet, on the internet forums? You know, like, yeah, right. Infinite. Yeah. Why are you paying well, they, attention? They, they, why? Wh not what are you doing? They get it you know, too. like, um, they get it too. So, yeah, of course. You know, look, I, look, I don't like yeah. calling for hyperinflation. Some people yeah. call me a doomer or some you know, gold bug negative guy, but I just, I just look at the math and uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I mm. think we could arrest it somewhere in the interim. They could reset to gold. They could reset to Bitcoin. They could cut the government expenses. They could try and balance the budget. I mean, there are things that could interrupt this process, you know, and, and then this just becomes a nice digital gold and it's, you know, it's a form of savings and that'll take it much higher than it is today. I mean, it hasn't, you know, the to total gold market today is roughly $13 trillion. And Bitcoin today is one point three trillion dollars. So mm. It hasn't even surpassed gold, you know, and it will at some point. So, um, so we, you know, we, yeah. I, I think it's going to do very, very well. You know, do we get hyper Bitcoinization where the dollar is dead and we're pricing everything in Sats? I think we will. My belief is we will actually get there. But you know, if we don't get there, that you know, that's fine too. I think it'll it'll still be a very good sound money investment. Yep. So. What you just said, if you have a hundred thousand cash, you should realize that it will never buy more yeah. than today in the future. It's true though. I mean, it's a fact. It's pretty crazy, actually. It's pretty much know yeah, that. I know, but yeah. it's it's. I never thought about it like that. But once you realize that, you like now for anyone listening, like now, just realize that that is oh, that, yeah. that is the get off your ass. Yeah, right. <laughs> instruction yeah, yeah, right? no, no, no. You, you can't have just have money sitting in a bank this. account a savings account no i mean it's yeah no it's tragic yeah. it's really tragic they're gonna you know i mean your pension all this stuff i mean it's yeah wow well. yeah it's it, the monetary debasement's a very evil thing it really is hurts a lot of people it really does yeah yeah okay all right, let's that, let's end on end on a high note i uh i ask everyone the same question as the last question and that is, what is a core belief you will oh, never let go? Well, I, I believe that there's a higher power and that we're all here for some God-given reason. And I believe that humans are fundamentally good. Most humans are fundamentally good, which doesn't mean that there aren't some who aren't. But um, I'll never let go of kind of optimism and, and the belief that in spite of all these problems, in spite of the turmoil that we're going to go through and, you know, I mean, hyperinflation we have, it's going to be very unpleasant. But that we are we are continually and surely moving and evolving toward a higher plane and a better society and a fairer society and a better life for more people. I mean, you know, in spite of all these problems we have, still life ex until very recently, life expectancies worldwide have gone up. And you know, look at all these technologies we've developed. And I mean, I just I, I'm a you know I, fundamentally, I will never give up on being an optimist. I'm very bullish on the world. I'm very bullish on mankind. Um, and I think that everything is going to work out great. But I, awesome. I also think that, you know, that, that doesn't mean that you don't grab an umbrella when it looks like it's going to rain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree. Well, thanks oh, so much thank for sharing you. that. And good thanks friend, so much for your time. I really you like. enjoyed this. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure you've got a good audience. And if I can help out in any way, let me know. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.